So I'm Adam. And I'm Eric. And uh, the first talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first subject is is uh, the some sort of overview of architecture and roadmap, sort of where we're going, and sort of a big picture kind of thing. Sort of seemed like a good place to start the the conference. And I think the key is that you know, this isn't supposed to be like a lecture. I'd like to try to get some participation. So if you have comments or want to say something or think that we're crazy and we drew some picture on the slide that looks really dumb or whatever, you know, raise your hand or let us know and we can expand it to a larger conversation. This is open source, right? We're probably wrong. So tell us when we're wrong. So I think we, we wanted to start uh, this discussion by talking about how times are changing, right? If you compare the way the world is today to the way the world is five years ago when Chrome launched as a product, the world has changed a lot. Um, for one thing, there are like a lot of positive changes in the world, like browser compatibility is like much, much better. We have a lot better standards that are like actually tell you like how the platform is actually supposed to work. And it's actually a feasible thing to like implement the, the browser by like going through the standard like line by line and like transcribing the algorithm in the spec to like code and you run the code and it like works <laughs> and you can like render web pages and that's like an amazing thing and that's really fantastic for browser compatibility but the big thing that's changed in these five years is is the rise of mobile if you look at charts of where usage is is going it's all all the growth is in mobile and we're really excited about that but it means that we need to change some of our thinking instead of thinking about you know, monitors that are 30 inches wide and machines that have 64 cores or whatever you have, you have much smaller screens and much less compute power. And how do we use those resources efficiently to create great experiences and a great platform that, that developers can use? So I, I think one way to, to think about this is you could ask like, who are the Joneses? This, this is a American idiom. I'm not sure if people outside the United States know this expression. <laughs> okay, so there was a, a comic strip called, um, do you know what it was called? Like keeping up with the Joneses or something like that. Anyway, the, the concept of the, of the comic strip was that there's, there were these two neighbors, and you know, on one side of the fence, this guy had this like green grass and all this like amazing stuff, and the, and the other guy, he that was the, that was the Joneses, and the main characters in the comic were on the other side of the of the fence, and they're always looking over there and like trying trying to keep up with the Joneses. So, who who are the Joneses? Like who who should we aspire to, or or what what is our main competition? So five years ago, you might have believed that our main competition was other browsers, like Firefox or Internet Explorer or such. But I would argue that today, really, our main competition and, and the, the people we should be looking over our shoulder at and thinking about how, how we can do better then are really native mobile platforms. So people, if you're a developer, you sort of have to choose today between writing in, say, Java or Objective-C or writing in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And what we really would like is for HTML and JavaScript and CSS to be a compelling platform for developers. So how do we how do we make the platform even better than native platforms? More developer productivity, um, better performance, these sorts of things. So the, the natural question is: so what are the what are the challenges? You know, why is there grass greener? What what is it on the other side of the fence that's alluring to developers that we need to improve on our side of the fence to be more attractive? So one is certainly like platform integration. Right? If you write in, in Objective-C or Java, you can integrate with the host platform a lot better. Um, and I think that's important, but I, I really think the big thing is performance. <laughs> like, that is like the number one driver. <laughs> um, I think if, if we provided a platform that was had awesome performance, was jank-free, and like worked great, I think developers would, would love it, even if the platform integration wasn't quite as, as good as, as uh, as on the other side of the fence. Or if our performance was better. Or better, yeah. There's this like tempting trap to like think of in your mind. You're like, well, how could you ever be better than, than native, right? Because like native is like below you, like closer to the metal or whatever. But that's not, not really true, right? If you think about like Windows development like five years ago, you could write a much more a much uh, more compelling experience on the web than you could by writing a native Windows binary. Because, well, it was a real big pain to write a native Windows binary, to write like a WinProc and like all this stuff. Whereas the web like solved a lot of those problems for you and allowed you to be more productive, right? So how do we, in, in this new mobile world, how do we create things that are like that? that that's, 
I think that's that's the challenge for all of us. So how do we do that? So I think the argument that I'd like to make is that we can do that by focusing. So do what we do faster. So parse faster, have a faster DOM, do style resolution better and faster, and all these core aspects of the engine, really optimize them, get, get the long poles out of the system. You know, if we spend spending all of our time like rearranging layers for the compositor, like that's kind of silly. That's a bunch of like work that we can do better. Maybe the compositor can pull that information from us. So we only have to compute it once a frame instead of like eagerly computing it all the time. You know, so focus on those core things. And then take the rest of the stuff that we have and try to move it out of the core or sort of isolate it, tie it up with a bow, put it off to the side so it doesn't um, hold us back in developing the, the core engine. So like some, some examples of that are like, um, we, we still have some OS specific code in Blink, which is sort of silly, right? Blink is this like, runs in a sandbox on this like virtual platform. Why does it have any OS specific code? But like, you know, if you want to convert key codes from like your, you know, keyboard to like web key codes, like that code is in Blink. It doesn't make any sense. Like, like that code should be handled by the embedder. The embedder should give us nice like webby platform independent key codes and we should go to town. Or like a, another example of that is the WebSockets protocol. There's a lot of like detail work in Blink to like send messages on a socket to implement WebSockets, which is really not what Blink is about. It's not the like core part of the engine. And so there's a in progress work to factor that out and put that in the network stack, which is really a much more sensible place to implement a network protocol. And so then when we're iterating on the engine, we don't have to worry about those concerns. Those concerns are dealt with elsewhere. And we can focus on really the core web experience. I should pause and do you buy this argument? Do you think I'm crazy? Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes crazy is good. Sometimes crazy is crazy. Yeah. Well, what about the performance? Uh, I mean, I, I would argue that you should look at a profile and see whether key code conversion shows up on profiles. And I've never, ever seen it on a profile. Um, I think the argument here is also less about abstraction and more about uh, division. It's not that we need to add five layers in between us and the key codes, to use the key codes example. It's that most Blink developers don't need to think about key codes. So why is that in our source space? That's more the argument. And key codes is, you know, it's already pretty isolated in the platform, but there are other things like the editing code that reaches all throughout rendering, which just probably doesn't belong there. Or like sometimes it's it actually you can think of it as a better architecture. Like moving the WebSocket code out of Blink into the network stack means that it runs in the browser process, you know, with the rest of the network code. Like why do you have to jump to into the render process just because historically the WebSockets protocol was implemented? It doesn't make any sense, right? So a lot of this is like uh, being released from design pressures that we had in the past and being able to like put things in more natural places. Adam, do you think that's because we no longer have to support, like WebKit was an engine that was used by multiple browsers. This link is really targeted at a single browser. This gives us an advantage, which is why we can <coughs> pull this stuff up to the layer now. Yeah. In the past. Yeah, I mean, I, like some of the reasons why these things were done here is because on other operating systems, the libraries that happened to be around on the system didn't implement WebSockets, right? And so then it became WebKit or Blink's job to do it because no one else was there. But in, in Chromium, you know, we have, it's, the system libraries are much more malleable, right? It's very easy to add features to the network stack to, to make uh, the system make more sense. And so it's much easier. Oh. Why do you think it's a bit different? I think part of that was just the idea that we can move more and more of the rendering side of Blink up and out into the compositing side. Um, yeah, let, let, let Skia take care of it. Use, use higher level primitives to talk to Skia so that they can then push that off to the compositor as instead of like in individually implementing a rounded rect in OS. Let's tell Skia, oh, here, have a rounded rect. They'll do a lot better. Because core graphics on Mac, 
didn't have a rounded rector, maybe it does. We, we couldn't talk that way. But now we can, because we control both sides. So we've made some progress. Um, like there's a sort of nonlinearity in this graph. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I what I like about that graph is not to like you know make fun of the nonlinearity, but to to look at what happens after that, right? So it's not like we dropped off this cliff and then like started going up at the same rate that we were going up before. These are like lines of code or something, right? We're actually sort of level or going down, which I think is actually a good thing. It means that the, the system is becoming simpler, right? The the less stuff there is, the easier it is to like hold it in your head, understand how the whole system works, and make like global changes. Like we like uh, uh, Greg talked about some of these, like replacing ref counting with garbage collection is like a really global change to the engine, right? And that really almost requires visiting like every line of code in the system, and like the fewer total lines of code you have, it becomes much easier to do those kinds of kinds of changes. So here's my attempt to draw the dependency diagram of Blink today. So th these represent, um, so Chromium has two builds. It has the static build where everything is like linked together, and it has the component build where things are factored into a bunch of dynamically linked libraries. So these, these are the actual uh, dynamically linked libraries that we have today. We, act we uh, actually split off WTF and a, a few other things into separate libraries, but by and large, the, the bulk of everything in Blink is in one big dilib. And what that means is that really we haven't done a good job of understanding our dependencies and, and factoring the code cleanly. Like we have in our mind a, a diagram of how the different parts of the system relate to each other, but if you actually like dig into it and see what's actually going on at like a you know linker like low level, those pictures in our mind are not actually quite right. And because of that we can't actually like pull apart Blink into different pieces, it really has a giant circular dependency in it. And so I, I think one of the things that, that I would like to see improve about the architecture is to make our mental model of how the system works match the reality of how the system actually works. And, and one way to do that is to like actually make these, this dependency diagram real and like have the linker enforce it. So actually seal these different layers out into different dynamically linked libraries and then you know, your thing won't compile on Windows if you violate the dependency diagram. And so then th this will, will match the reality of how, of, of, of how we think the system works. And so, so there's some ideas in here that, that I'm sure you like are familiar to you, like the idea of these different modules. So if we actually could link the different modules as different dynamically linked libraries, that would mean that, uh, that we would really understand the connection between the, the core rendering engine and these different modules. So right now, a bunch of the modules have these like backdoors, like media stream, like hooks into like media HTML media element, and like uh, you know uh, has this like tight coupling. Whereas if we could actually separate it out and, and and link it separately, then we would have a much better isolation and understand that. Which means that then you can take one of those pieces and you can replace it with something else. You can make it way faster. You can do radical changes when you actually know what your dependencies are. T today, like platform has backdoors into, into core, and modules have backdoors into bindings. And th this is almost what we can do, but not quite. So we like to actually even go further. And this is not what you see today. But we'd like to further divide what we have today as the core directory and do really crazy things like take the XSLT support, pull it out of core, maybe rewrite it in Ruby, uh, you know, take the the editing support and Lua. rip it out of core. Lua. Lua would be a good choice. Accessibility should have a real API to talk to the underpinnings of Blink. 
the inspector should be moved. It's, you know, largely moved, but it, it should be moved even better. Um, you know, and you see then a core that has holes compared to what today. Uh, you, a notable exception in core is also that the loader. Right now, we do all the loading in core, but as I think was just on Blink Dev yesterday, we're talking about pulling some of that out so we can share that between Blink instances. Anyways, this is, this is a ways in the future, but this is where we'd like to go, or in this direction. So I guess the whole, the idea that we try to convey in this half of the talk is that one of the things we'd like to do in the next six months in Blink is to continue trying to focus on doing fewer things and doing them faster. What about doing them the same way? Because today, like the rendering is different on Android and on desktop. You mean in terms of compatibility between our? I, yeah, that's an implicit assumption that we would like. Just as you see in those intent emails, you know, is this going to work on all of our platforms? We want all five of our platforms to be the same. Yeah, there are in some cases like, like we're trying to remove vendor prefixes, but in some cases we're willing to enable some vendor prefixes on Android if that brings up the parity between the platforms. Because I think having a, a platform that works the same everywhere is more valuable than having fewer prefixes, if that makes sense. So that, that's a very something very dear to at least my heart. So we're going to talk in a second, extending uh, Greg's discussion of our roadmap, what we see us doing, at least those of us who sit inside the Google organization, in the next you know, six months or so, or, or, or longer. Um, but maybe we should talk a little bit before that about what we showed for architecture. Does this jive with the general consensus in the community that this kind of division is, is a good thing? Yes, I see head shakes. Anyways. This is what we're working on in, in San Francisco, and I presume as much in some of our other offices, and we'd like to see more of that uh, in the community and want to be supportive of that in the community. Making things simpler to understand so that we can move faster, so that we can make the things that we do understand faster. I think part of that is also like, as was sort of hinted at in this slide, like once you have some understanding of the boundaries between these different pieces, it becomes much easier to refactor them. So if you wanted to do something, you know, sort of crazy in style resolution, like, you know, jet your style resolver or something, then if you have a, a well-defined boundary between that and the rest of the system, it becomes much easier to make those kinds of changes. Otherwise, if everything has a backdoor to everything else, you don't know until you get like three months into your, your project whether this is actually going to work out. So like one project that Eric and I did is we've uh, replaced the original HTML parser with a standards compliant parser. And one reason that we were able to do that is because the parser had a, a pretty well-defined interface with the rest of the system. I think the doctor forgets that we created that interface before we replaced the parser. <laughs> so I guess, I guess what I'm arguing is that we have a lot of technical debt to pay back because of years of other constraints that no longer apply to our project. And paying back a little bit of that now allows us not only to do the short-term big performance wins, but also allows us to think even further than we can today with our really constrained, really incestuous uh, directories. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so we've been talking about performance a lot, mobile a lot. Um, I'm wondering, maybe we should mention preference as well. Just, I mean, I'm OK with not mentioning it in the sense that maybe everyone is expecting to have their part in the preference. Sure. That makes sense. But right now, there's a lot of places where we correct yet, uh, especially in the rendering. And I feel like it's worth pointing out, pointing that out, and mentioning that it seems the direction you're going will be really nice also from the perspective of going towards unit testing. And if uh, I don't, I would like to hear what other people say. Uh, personally, I think unit testing can help us a lot in terms of performance and reducing here, our here. reliance on layout tests, which not only are a little bit hard to get to test things correctly, but they're also a bit of a burden to yeah, I, mean, I think that's another benefit that you get out of out of a approach like this, where you have things that are have well defined boundaries. That means you can test them in isolation from the rest of the system, and that means your tests can be faster and more detailed. And and I completely agree with you.
systems like that need two sides. So the inspector already has some of this today. There's the inspector directory or the dev tools directory where like all the inspector front end and then there's still inspector, uh, I think there's still an inspector directory inside core. And you need both sides. You need something to be exposing the API as well as something to be consuming the API. And we, we have some of that already for accessibility, but one of the things that this is arguing for is that we could do more of that. Just understand, like, maybe we should have an API directory on the rendering directory that lists our 10 functions that is how you talk to rendering. You know, or maybe it's 100, but at least then we would know. Right now we don't know. So it's not that accessibility necessarily wants to move or that the inspector needs to move completely out of the source base, but just we want to be very careful about what the actual interactions between the components are. Uh, so Darren was saying that sometimes we try and add a public API to Blink, what used to be called the WebKit API, and somebody who knows a little bit more about rendering will come along and be like, ah, no, you can't do that, that's dangerous. You need X, Y, or Z to have happened before that call is safe. And we, we have exactly this all over the source space where somebody will grab at something, but layout won't be up to date, or layout will be up to date, but style won't be up to date. Uh, and because we have all these sharp edges, because we don't have an easy path, because we don't have just five APIs that are the only APIs they know how to use, uh, it's easy to get things wrong. So I don't know how long we've used, but we should move on to roadmap. Uh, so we try to divide this up into three sections. We're, these aren't necessarily ordering. These are some things that are already in progress that people are working on. Obviously, it's a big open source project. Lots of people work on lots of different things. But we're excited about web components. We're going to have a lot of talk about web components in these two days, making them fast. Uh, there's a lot of edges in the engine where the engine just wasn't designed with web components in mind. So we need to iron out a lot of those. We're doing that soon. We have a whole team working on animations. Uh, we would like, as Tom was saying, to integrate better with our auditor brethren up above. There's historically been a big divide between those who are brave enough to go work on WebKit and those who, you know, would rather not deal with that stress. And <laughs> now that we maybe don't have as much of that stress, we could integrate a little better, talk to each other better. And so we'd like to integrate better with the compositor up above us. Uh, the font system currently has four different platforms all inside Blink. They're all written differently and they all are broken in different ways. Uh, Emil and others are working on helping fix that. Um, we want to keep removing stuff. And as we've talked about a lot in this talk, we'd like to break the modules down better. So it's interesting that that's the third time that that's been brought up in this talk. So that's telling me something, that maybe we aren't talking enough about compatibility. Uh, it was surprising to me, what, we have an internal conference every year uh, for Google called ChromeConf, where the Chrome team meets with a bunch of other teams, they fly in. And one of the things I learned from that, from the you know, 50, 100 people that I talked to, was that they all said the same thing. All the web devs from all the like various app teams, they said, can you make it faster? Can you make it faster? Can you make it faster? Um, I didn't hear a lot of, can you make it behave more the same with Firefox? But I agree. I think that's implicit. We we should be identical to the specs. Yeah, I think we're taking some of that for granted. Like, the as I said in the first slide, one of the things that's gotten a lot better over the last five years is compatibility. And because the W3C is like more of a going concern and people are participating and engaged there and their test suites and like, I feel like we're doing a good job. I'm sure we can do better. But I feel like that's not the like biggest pain point that developers are complaining about at the moment. You know, maybe if we take our eye off that ball and we'll like slip, and developers will be sad. 
Um, so we should try not to take our eye off that ball. Uh, there aren't any good examples. You're right. Uh, and that's all historical constraints that are gone. So LGTM, please write more tests. <laughs> yeah, so as a concrete example uh, uh, about that, uh, you know, we drew this diagram of all these different die libs. And so last night I said, oh, I, I should try, like, try this to like, see if this is like total crazy. So I, I wrote a CL that like, created a platform die lib that has like one thing in it. And like, the, the next thing I did is I wrote a test for that class because it was the clock class. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the clock class. And the clock class never had a unit test. Like, and, but it's like an inherently like unit testable thing, right? It has a start function and a stop function, and it like tells you whether it's like running. So like you can write this like, and so so as part of this, I think naturally by better separating the concerns and instead of having one giant ball of wax, you have a lot of smaller balls of wax. It becomes much easier to test. Balls of steel. Balls of steel. Yes. <laughs> that sounds wrong, Dimitri. <laughs> A lot of WebCore's design 10 years ago was for licensing concerns. It was the big LGPL bucket. And we don't have that problem anymore. So we can split it up into lots of little pieces. Uh, KHTML did not come with unit tests 10 years ago. These days, they probably do. Um, we should have unit tests. We, we, we well, do actually have unit tests. I, I know we have some, but like <laughs> we should have, but we should have 30,000 unit tests instead of you know 100 or 1,000 that we have today. But, but I mean, unit tests are not just like taking your system and like slapping on unit tests, right? To have to have a good good testable system, you need to think about how the pieces fit together so you can test them in isolation, right? Otherwise, every unit test will be like a web frame impl unit test, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not what you want. There was a hand in the back. You should can, talk can you to repeat Emil? the question? I couldn't uh, he, he asked about platform independent fonts. You should talk to the man in the suit right here. Um, he can tell you all about it, but the, the short and the long is that, uh, is that we have misfit designs. A lot of it, again, coming because WebKit was way over here, and Skia was way over here, and each of the four platforms chose slightly different integration points, Windows versus Androids versus uh, Linux. Uh, versus Mac, and we should just have one true way. Give me the font for this character, uh, and we don't. And and by fonts, I mean the system integration with the the system's fonts, as opposed to the web fonts, which is stuff that Blink handles. But the man in the suit knows more. Emil. So I I mean. <laughs> you don't see performance listed as like 10 bullet points. That doesn't mean we like forgot about it from the first half of the talk to the second half of the talk. It's just a hard thing to put in your roadmap. It's just, it's important. <laughs> oh yeah, I think Tony is giving a talk later. I think he's the next talk. Oh, he's the next talk. Uh, oh, maybe that's mobile. Two more. Two more. Okay. Uh, so more medium term stuff. Uh, SVG needs z-ordering. Doesn't have it today. And the way you get z-ordering in our system is using this gigantic class called a render layer. That's a problem. we got to fix it. Um, the widget tree is this crazy, uh, it does a lot of things, but it, it used to, its primary functionality was to integrate with the native view system. We don't have a native view system. So we don't need a widget tree, at least not in its current forms. We really want out-of-process iframes. That's going to require a bunch of rejiggering. Uh, the oil pan project is, is what this is, the unified C++ JS driver collector, which I'm sure we will talk more about. Um, we'd like to get rid of more stuff that's just bogging down the platform. And you know, as we talked about earlier, we'd like to split things up more. So I think one thing that's worth highlighting about this slide is, is the out-of-process iframes. So that, that really changes how you think about the engine. So right now, mentally, I think people think of, of Blink as like a web view. It's like a box, then then like, does stuff in this box. So in, in a, if you think about out-of-process iframes, Blink becomes more of like a frame server, where like it, 
it can populate regions of the screen that are being composited by other parts of the system as iframes or plugins get composited in. And so it, a single instance of Blink doesn't have a global view of what's going on in the web view. It has a, a partial view of what's going on. And so that means systems like, like history that require a global understanding of what's happening in, in this tab or this view don't really make sense in Blink. They make sense in a sort of a higher layer system that's, that's coordinating. So uh, the browser process means it's a navigation controller that's coordinating the whole thing will understand the history. And Blink's job will be to you know, render a, a frame. Um, and, and that's also connected with what we were talking about earlier about focusing on the, the core things that Blink is, is providing value for. Like Blink has a history system, but that's not really like core to the engine, right? It doesn't like feed into the HTML, CSS, JavaScript machine. There's like a few APIs like go backwards and forwards, but largely it's like a controller layer on top of the whole thing. And so there's really a concern that really belongs in a, a different layer. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that could go on this list, um, but this is some, some taste of what I am aware of uh, folks on our team working on. And we haven't forgotten again. <laughs> In case the, the message isn't clear, performance is important. And these are then a list of crazier stuff that we don't necessarily have people working on, but have been talked about and sound exciting once we deal with other bigger, closer at hand problems. We'd like to use more parallelism, but current testing reveals that uh, we just have so many long poles that we have to get rid of first. Um, there's been some talk of making style resolution even more awesome. Uh, one of the problems with the web platform is that it has lots of sharp edges, lots of ways that your page starts out fast and then you added a collapsed margin and goodbye. It'd be nice if we had a way to, to, to run in the web without that. We're still talking. I think one way to think about that is like, if you think about like the relationship between Asm.js and JavaScript, right? Somehow Asm is this like fast mode for JavaScript that like doesn't really work the way JavaScript works, but kind of will like run anywhere JavaScript will run. So what is, what is Asm.js for the whole platform? Like, that's a good idea. How do we scale it up to the platform? Like, maybe that's like this where you like disable a few slow features and maybe it's like a radically different way of like, of like, a radically radical subset of what you're doing. Like maybe you only have absolute position things and JavaScript is in charge of all of layout and something, or I, I mean, I don't know. These are like speculative ideas. Um, we tried some of this uh, earlier this year with an uh, effort called Lazy Block, which was sort of a fast mode for layout and learned a whole bunch of things that we should just delete or just do faster. Um, and a lot of good has come out of that work. And I think if we, if we tug on this fast mode uh, forward a little more, we might find lots of other good things that'll shake out. Um, we would like it so that if you want to extend Blink, you don't have to be in Blink. Already people are doing this up in the sort of Chromium layers with sort of hacks and stuff, and we'd like to make that easier, better. You should be able to use our IDL system, but you can't really easily today. Yeah, today when the IDL generator generates code, it generates code with all these like internal types. And you can like look inside and see everything that's there. But if there was a better boundary there, then you could hope that the boundary is like sort of semi-stable and like somebody could write one of those modules like far away and like only talk to you every like six months and live a happy life and have code that worked. And today that's really sort of difficult. You have to like keep talking to them because you change the way ref pointer works and they like use ref pointer, you know. And this is related to the last bullet on the slide. Uh, We've talked on the mailing list and had strong opinions expressed in both ways about removing XSLT from the platform. Uh, we still really like to do that, but maybe we have to make it, or we probably have to make it possible for somebody with a really big XSLT install to be able to have an extension that like provides XSLT. And it's not quite possible today, but we'd like to make it better. Writing more features outside of Blink that don't need to know about all the internal guts would be good. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. So 
So the question was, uh, if we create all these boundaries and APIs, like how are we going to document that so people can understand how to how to use them effectively? So I think there's some like tactical things. So there are these depths files that you can write that say you're allowed to include from this directory and not from that directory. And so uh, today a lot of those like rules are this like oral tradition that like get passed on in code review to code review and like maybe not fully disseminated to everyone who's writing code. And and so there's some like technical mechanism for that already that we just need to make better use of. Um, but I think a broader answer to your question is that we don't really know. Right? We have this idea that we want to modularize things, but we don't understand the details yet. And so as we get further down that path, when we understand the details better and they sort of crystallize in gel, that's a good time to write documentation. Um, so like I, I did this with the like string refactor, right? I spent a lot of time like cleaning up the string class. And when I finally felt it was in some sort of stable state, I wrote this like, I don't know, a couple page document that's like, okay, here's how it works. Um, and so I think as people are doing this, I would encourage them to do the same thing. When you think you've arrived at a good state that you think is something that we should maintain and, and perpetuate, that's a good time to write some documentation to like explain what it is about this state that's good and how do we stay there. I think we also just need like a readme in the modules directory. We we it's kind of a little bit of the wild west right now. We have like 30 modules or something like that I discovered last night. They're not all real in the sense that they don't all self-contain themselves. They're not really modular. Um, but that's kind of the dream and we I think in, in the near term, we're trying to get to that dream where they actually would be modules. And when we do that, as Dr. Broad says, we should document that. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a a good, that's a good point. Like a lot of those modules are sort of a little bit aspirational. Like we wish that they were self-contained, but they like aren't quite. Like especially in media, which is probably why you're the person asking this question. <laughs> but, it, but if we actually get to this future where they really link as separate dynamic libraries, then you, you won't need a lot of documentation. Like the, the compiler will just fail. And you'd be like, oh, I guess I have a bad dependency in here somewhere. And so that like, that will help keep us on, on a good trajectory. I think we should also just talk more today and tomorrow. And I think we should write a doc. I, I, you clearly have a lot of knowledge and opinion here, and we should just dump it down in a Word document or a Drive document. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would like there to be a content show conference. I, I think the like the culture of different parts of the project is a little bit different. Like we have a, a good open culture, and I'd like to see that spread throughout the broader Chromium project. So hopefully, if if you know the people and the code travel together, maybe that means the culture will diffuse more, and and people will be more excited about that sort of thing. My goal would also not be to necessarily just throw you over the wall, uh, but <laughs> it, like, <laughs> we we also can have things that maybe sit above Blink inside the Blink repo. And there's also a dream, or so they tell me, that when we get Git, we can merge the repos. You know, that's that's another thing that's sort of missing from the medium term timeline is that we would like to see that happen or parts of that happen, um, what that means for culture and, you know, uh, lots up in the air, but. You don't need to rename all your files with underscores or something? I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yes. I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we came to the end of the slides that we prepared, so maybe 
Yeah. So, um, what I heard your performance say is uh, you were talking to some web developers pretty recently. Um, they were pointing out some deficiencies in the platform compared to, say, the Ernest Data app and web application. For example, the logo of Black System. Resistance and adding some of these features to even what you achieve by the bootstrap team and instead of the Can you comment a little bit on the intent and mechanism behind that? What the goal is to make a prototype stuff like this that can be really needed by some web apps, but it's difficult to motivate them until it's actually implemented in a testing context of that. Yeah, I mean, this is like a so the, the question is there's a uh, if you have an exciting idea for a, a new feature, even if it's like awesome for performance, how do you make it happen in the world? Like there's this chicken and egg problem with standards and implementers and all this stuff. And yeah, I, mean, that, that, I think that's a hard problem. And I think one thing we try to do with the intent to implement and intent to ship system is to like add some sort of intermediate step where you can implement something and experiment with it without shipping it. And hopefully that, that helps bootstrap the sort of standards chicken and egg problem because you can say, look, I implemented it in a real engine that like really works. Like go turn on this experimental flag, and you can see for yourself how much awesome it makes image decoding. Um, but but that at the same time we don't want to you know race ahead of every every other browser and ship all these features to the world and create this compatibility nightmare. We really want to bring all browser vendors together with us and have a coherent web platform. And so hopefully the like the two step you know implement ship process helps that. Um, like in the end you you'll still need to to evangelize your feature and convince other browser vendors that it's worth doing. Otherwise, you're not really building a web platform, you're building a Chrome platform. I think we've tried, I don't know, we've been successful at, as a part of separating these, making it easier to implement and harder to ship. I don't know that we've struck that balance. We have a lot of examples in the past of doing things wrong. Like I think the WebKit prefixes, you know, CSS prefixes were kind of a mistake for the platform. Uh, we'd like to avoid doing that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know that we have enough good examples yet of doing it right. And so for, for you guys, hopefully you just implement behind a flag and get to be able to convince the, w, uh, the wet WG that you've done it right. I think another answer to that question is if we sort of get further in this modularization dream, it becomes much easier to do things on branches, right? If your your feature can be an out of trunk module that like is easy to maintain and doesn't get broken every Thursday, then it becomes way easier to just like prototype your thing and say, look, you know, if you just copy and paste this directory here, it like wires itself in, or you don't even have to like talk to the rest of the community, you can just do that yourself. And it becomes way easier to do prototyping of new features. We're a little, we're a little ways from that dream, but. Yeah. yeah uh, you had a performance slide like three times, but no memory slide. Are you including memory here, or are you, is that not one of the main I think memory and performance are very like tightly coupled. But. Well, we also should work on kerning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I mean, we, we recently went through this thing where we did a very like deep dive study on memory across the entire browser to try to like get the memories down in, in M29 and M30. And uh, I think we should continue doing stuff like that and, and working on memory. Like, it, Memory is this funny, it's a little bit different than runtime performance in that there tend to be like big blobby things and then like, like it's huge sea of tiny things. And so it's easy to become distracted by like the huge sea of tiny things. And really the big wins on memory come from figuring out how to do the, handle the few big things well. So like Tony sent an email to, to Blink Dev yesterday, I think, that was about sharing more uh, cache information between processes. And while that's good for performance, it's also good for memory. You don't have a separate copy of a font cache in each of your render processes. You use less memory because you don't. Not everyone needs to know that the letter E corresponds to like this, like funny squiggle, right? Like you only really need to know that once. And that thing is like you know eight megabytes of, of memory, you know, per process. So it adds up. Android twenty on desktop. Twenty on desktop. Yeah. So. But yes, memory is part of part of the performance loop. What 
Yeah, I think we need to get better at, at that, looking at how many resources are available in the system and then using that to tune trade-offs between memory and performance. So like there's there was a CL that would try to add this like bit that was like, am I on a low memory device? And like the low, like if you had, if that bit was set, then you should like, you know, throw away all your runtime performance to like squeeze into memory. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's the best approach. I think something that's a, a smoother ramp is probably better where we get better signals from the outside world that we're under memory pressure or that the system as a whole doesn't have much memory. And then we use that to, to trade off things. We also can just assume that we're running on a low memory device because that's not necessarily true today, but it's going to be true very soon. The, the growth curves are, are, are very different between desktop and, and mobile, and mobile's winning. What about battery usage? Something that we don't know a whole lot about, but there are people in this room who do. Uh, he asked about battery usage. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to learn more about battery usage, so maybe someone should do a, a talk today about battery, if you know a lot about battery. We have all these like sessions in the schedule that are like, are empty and would, would love to learn more about this stuff. I suspect some of the Intel and Samsung wizards in this room know a lot more about battery usage than the two of us do. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh,